Welcome to this podcast from the Triple Helix Cambridge March Café Scientifique event, sponsored by the Medical Research Council. I'm Mira Senthilingam from thenakedscientist.com. Each month, the Triple Helix Society in Cambridge hosts a free event at the ADC Theatre, looking into various scientific issues and allowing you to put your questions to the scientists involved. This month's Café Scientifique investigated how our brains take dangerous shortcuts when taking in the world around us, and simply put, how they jump to delusions. To find out more about these shortcuts and why our brain takes them, I caught up with the event speaker, Dr Paul Fletcher, from the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, before the event kicked off. Well, I'm very interested in uh, a particular symptom of mental illness called delusions, which are the very strange beliefs that some people with certain mental illnesses suffer. (laughs) And it's a real challenge to try and understand what might be going wrong to produce these beliefs. And I, I want to talk about how understanding normal beliefs and the formation of normal beliefs might help us to understand what goes wrong in delusions. Um, I'm particularly interested in how, while we may think that we're very logical in the way we process our information, actually we're prone to lots of biases and we often get things completely wrong. So when you take that into account, account, I think that um, delusional beliefs don't seem as comparatively irrational as perhaps you might first think. So to start off with then, what exactly is classed as a delusion? A delusion would be where somebody seems to arrive at a very bizarre, often frightening belief without any apparent good evidence. So, for example, somebody might come to the conclusion that their neighbours are trying to poison them. Now, if you ask their neighbours, they've never done anything, they've been perfectly friendly, but this person may have, over a period of weeks or months, just begun to believe that the neighbours are looking at them in strange ways. So this belief develops, and once it's there, it's held with really quite extraordinary tenacity, and it's very difficult to, to get rid of the belief. So, in essence, a delusion is a belief that arises in a strange way and is held with a, an enormous degree of tenacity, even though there's strong evidence against it. And why is it thought to arise in the first place? Well, this is what we don't know, really. I mean, this is what the research is about. My own belief is that there may be some fundamental changes in the way that people form associations about the world, and there may be abnormalities in certain brain processes that cause them to process the world in ways that are different and to form associations more readily, perhaps, than do people who don't have delusional beliefs. Now, you mentioned that something you want to get across today is how our brain processes information and the world around us. So how does it go about doing that? I think the central principle when we think about how we process the world is that we often have the sense that we are able to rationally and in an unbiased way look at our sensory information and draw our conclusions accordingly. But actually, um, most of what we conclude from our sensory information is largely shaped and warped by what we already believe. So in other words, we we tend to look at the world in order to confirm what we believe rather than to learn new stuff. I think the way that um, it exerts its influence on its incoming sensory information really is in in two ways. Firstly, we're very selective about the information we process. So although we may think that we have the whole picture of the world, very often we're only focusing on a very small part of it, which of course is very natural because if we try to take in all our sensory information, we'd be paralysed by information. So one thing we do is we're very selective about information and evidence. And the other thing we do is we tend to fill in the gaps. Um, We're often confronted with very noisy data from our senses and rather than just accepting that noise what we tend to do is make up the bits that aren't there and use our prior experience really to paint the canvas a bit more fully. So does our brain essentially do this just because there is just always so much information that's coming through and needs to be processed? Yeah I think I think we have to recognize that as we move around sampling our environment firstly our senses do not faithfully record the world really they just give us a a rough representation which is very noisy so the noise in the data means that we have to use our prior beliefs but on top of that there is so much coming in and if we attended to everything we really would struggle to compute even the simplest of actions or thoughts so it's a combination of those two things the fact that the data are noisy and the fact that there's so much of it and what would you say the flaws are essentially of our brains working in this way well they can become very inflexible It's all very well to use our prior experience in order to shape our incoming information, if that is indeed the case. It's actually the case that very often we make stuff up that isn't accurate, and this can lead us to being inflexible, blinkered, narrow-minded in the face of new information. So there's a real challenge to be both robust and to use our 
prior knowledge and understanding, but at the same time to be sufficiently flexible that we're able to alter our views should the necessity arise. So the fact that we now know about this, or you're now telling us about this, would that hopefully make us more flexible and less um, narrow-minded, essentially? Unfortunately, I don't think that's so. A lot of this goes on at a very unconscious level. And there's a lovely illusion that was described by Richard Gregory, a neurophysiologist, in which he confronted people, he showed people a rotating hollow mask, which I'm going to show this evening. And essentially we have such strong prior information that faces stick out, they don't stick in, they tend to be convex rather than concave. As the mask rotates and we see the hollow side of the mask, we can't help but see it sticking out. So we're unable to see a hollow face, if you like, we're unable to see a face that's sticking in, even though we know it's hollow. So the fact that we consciously know it's hollow but still cannot refrain from seeing it as being a normal face suggests that just knowing stuff doesn't mean that we actually uh, are able to change the way our brains process the world. So having explained all of this about the way our brain processes information and the world around us, what would you say the main kind of conclusion you want the audience to walk away with this evening is? Well, I'd like them to think or to believe that um, as we move around the world and draw our conclusions about it, we're existing in this balance between uh, what we already know, which we don't fundamentally want to change, but at the same time the evidence of new information that suggests we ought to change it. And existing in this balance puts us in a difficult situation. Um, I think the message is we can veer one way or the other inappropriately at at different times and and therefore come to illogical conclusions. And I'd like to suggest that if we recognise that, perhaps when we're confronted with people who do suffer from clinical delusions, that perhaps we should have a bit more understanding of that. Dr Paul Fletcher from the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge with a brief insight into how our brains process the masses of information entering every second, and as a result, how a delusion may not be as unusual as we think. But remember, the main aim of Café Scientifique is to help the residents of Cambridge understand more about the topic, and this month's event was once again packed. So after Paul's talk, as usual, the audience members got their questions answered. Is there a distribution, I mean, have you done enough work to see a distribution of this effect? I mean, you've got two extremes, you've got normal and then you know, people with a condition, schizophrenia or something. Is there a spectrum of this pattern? I think that's a terrific question, actually, and psychiatry has been arguing hotly amongst itself over whether psychosis represents the end of a continuum or is truly a categorical jump. Um, What we've done is looked at people who score differently on various scales that measure delusion-like thinking. So there are a number of scales that have been developed in London and other places that really tap into these ideas that are like delusions but aren't quite. Do you ever feel that everybody's looking at you? Or do you ever feel that um, people are laughing at you? So the sorts of things that many of us do experience, actually. I mean, this is very early and unpublished yet, but the abnormalities or the differences in this prediction error signal that we're being in the we're seeing in the brain, do seem to correlate with the degree of how far you are along that continuum. So, yes, I think, I think it is a continuum, and I think uh, we need to think of delusional beliefs in terms of variance of a norm. Albeit, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't some categorical change at the point where it becomes illness. But I do think that you know, viewing it in the context of a continuum will be very helpful. Is it uh, our ability to be delusional uh, just uh, uh, something going wrong with us, or actually it has some actually function, evolutionary function, for example? I mean, I think being deluded, really, you get to the point of having a clinical diagnosis of, of being deluded at the point where it really is harmful to yourself and or others. Um, and in fact, sometimes that's the only difference between somebody who's deluded and somebody else who actually has a good business um, speaking to the spirits of people's relatives, you know. Um, you know, in, in terms of the nature of the beliefs... Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can find a difference, and except insofar as that one group suffers through them and the others don't. I don't think the delusion itself is advantageous at the point where we recognise it as a clinical delusion. However, I do think that the predisposing factors to it may be. So an increased sensitivity, let's say, to prediction error, an increased flexibility and willing to, willingness to change your belief in the face of seemingly novel evidence might uh, actually portend or show a heightened sensitivity to changing environments. And of course, environments do change, and people who can change with them do have a a survival advantage. So there could well be something in that sensitivity that relates to an evolutionary advantage or some sort of advantage. Yeah, I think so. 
I wondered if scientists knew the biological difference between imagination and illusions. I suppose the interesting thing about imagination is it's always recognised as being entirely internal. It remains described as imagination insofar as you are prepared to say this is the product of my mind, and yet a delusion is something which people completely attribute to the outside world. So maybe that's a critical difference, but whether work is act empirical work has been done on that, I don't know. Is this the same as heightened sensations or something when like a person is put in a jungle, say, and they are so they they their sensations heightened, that's what they say. How different is this from that? I think it's the same system. I mean, I think when people are placed in novel, unpredictable situations, then they become more alert, they become more aroused, they become more anxious, and that fulfills, presumably, a survival role. And one of the things that you need to do in novel situations is to learn to predict. And so you become much better at forming associations, much more avid in directing your attention around to gather new and relevant information. So I would say, and from my discussions with people who are at the very early stages of of a delusional illness, I would say that actually the pattern they present is one that has a lot of anxiety to it, and it's like they've been placed in this in, this new world in which nothing is comfortable or familiar, everything must be reappraised and ultimately explained. How would you reconcile that evidence um, that you have as a, as a neuroscientist with other areas of society that place a very high value on human experience, and have, for instance, the legal profession, which puts a very high value on eyewitness testimony, you know, science can show that to be extremely unreliable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think you have a responsibility to inform the public and inform other professionals that, in fact, the evidence shows that that's not the case? Yes, yes, and thrice yes. I mean, the, the eyewitness testimony is a great example of stuff that, of these phenomena really having major force for the bad. You know, human memories are very faulty. We often create them. The extent to which we have a responsibility to to let people know. I mean, my sense is, I, this isn't my field, but my sense is that there are good neuroscientists, particularly in the States, who are thumping that particular tub. Whether people are listening or not is, is another matter. I mean, I'm, what, would, what would you suggest we can do? I mean, I'll give you an example of, of false memories. There's a woman called Elizabeth Loftus in Washington, and she's done some wonderful work. She was very troubled by... Um, a number of cases of satanic abuse reports that were being revived under therapy, they'd been suppressed and then were revived. And and she felt that the people who were reporting these, and actually they were coming to court, didn't seem insincere, but actually that their stories were so self-contradictory and impossible at times that something was going on. And so she decided to try and do what she could to see if she could create false memories in the lab. And one of the studies she did was a very clever one. She, She got students in, healthy undergraduates, and she would say something to them like, okay, we've spoken to one of your family, and they remember this great trip you had to Disneyland when you were five, and you had your picture taken with Bugs Bunny, and you had a wonderful day, and then you went for tea, and they said, no, I don't remember any of that. And Actually, no, she didn't say five, I think it was seven or eight. And they said, I don't, I don't remember any of that. So then, over a period of one or two days, she would say to them something like, okay, well, I've asked them again, and they say, you definitely did it. So just imagine what it would be like if you'd had that. Just imagine how great it would be to cuddle Bugs Bunny and have your picture taken and then go off for a, a big tea. And by day two, they were swearing blind. They'd had a great time. They'd gone off. And they, remember, they, were, they were remembering things that she hadn't even told them about. And then she said to them, well, of course, it's unlikely you'd have had your picture taken with Bugs Bunny. He's a Warner Brothers character. So he wouldn't have been in Disneyland anyway. And the, the whole thing was fake, but people swore blind to it. You can engender these fictitious memories in people. And so it's that that we need to deal with, because depending on the nature of questioning, it's possible to warp, distort, and create people's memories. So your point is perfectly right, so I'm turning the question back on you. What do you think we should be doing? I mean, mm. but I agree. I, there's a lot, there's a lot of... And the, the converse is true. There are neuroscientists using imaging in a consultative way with the courts in America, and it's being used as evidence, which is absolutely crass as far as I'm concerned. We need to be very, very careful. Yeah, I'm going to preface my my question with the fact that I actually suffer from psychotic mental illness. And about five years ago, I was quite ill and was believing that there was going to be a nuclear war and imminently making preparations. I'm curious about your, your shift that you're showing there. Is that transitory? Because I'm curious to know why I'm so much better now when I was so ill then, if you see what I mean. 
yes, from what we can see, it is transitory. Under normal circumstances or under situations where the delusion is not there, actually the response is indistinguishable from somebody who doesn't suffer from psychotic illness. Now, the big question is, how can that happen? How can something emerge over a period of time, stay there, and then go? Do you think in terms of subjective and objective? Because um, science has this belief in an objective reality, but I don't actually believe that there's an objective reality without, without the subject. But the subject and the object kind of inter interact. So actually what we're doing is we're trying to describe the mind, which is our mind. We're both subject and object. You know, scientists are subject. And it's a bit like the quantum, sort of quantum principle. You interfere in a way with the experiment just by observing it. And, so on. and this whole subjective-objective um, pole, there's two poles, and we're somewhere between those two poles. We're never completely in the objective or the subjective. Yeah. When people are in maybe a state of early illness, not only is it can you scientifically change your observations by the way you observe them, but I think clinically it can happen as well, because there's a period, I think, where a psychiatrist who has very fixed opinions about what the diagnostic categories are of mental illness, you can find them negotiating with the person so that they turn these primordial soup of experiences that are yet, have yet to really crystallise, they turn it into symptoms that are much more understandable for both of them. We should always be wary um, of, of creating something that we had originally intended to measure. We can certainly make objective measures of the brain. Now, I think the brain is the mind, but we can still observe certain areas of the brain, how they respond, how they interact with each other in a way that is adequately objective. Can you just say what kind of range of things you've done this challenge with? I mean, you showed us the, the visual things and the auditory things. Is it, is it that kind of thing, or, or are there you know, things related to people's disease? That, that well, you... at present, we do them in probably what might seem fairly mundane. We, 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 de we devise simple associative learning tasks. I mean, we, we really are trying to boil it down to the nuts and bolts based on sim simple games about association. So we might get them to imagine that they're um, an allergist and that there's somebody who eats certain foods and gets certain allergic reactions and it's their job to try and predict which foods will cause which allergic reactions. So you can engender all these complicated combinations of meals and produce subtle changes in expectancy and you can then violate them or fulfil them. So at present what we're doing is is treating it as, as very much a lab-based thing. And we're doing that also with motor, sensory motor tasks and that. So lots to investigate still in this area. But it seems there isn't simply a distinct line between those of us who have delusions and those who don't. A good range of questions answered there. Now, after the event, I caught up with some audience members to find out what they thought of it all. It was a pretty intriguing title and it kind of... you. I came in with not much of an expectation. Like, I figured I was going to learn, you know, his science, and, and it was a very good introduction. I, I, uh, I was expecting an informed opinion, argument about how and perhaps even why we come to delusions, or how we come to shortcut, how we come to making shortcuts too quickly. And what made you come along to tonight's events? How did you hear about it, or why does this topic interest you? I'm quite fascinated how my mind works, how I come to conclusions about things which then prove, prove to be wrong, that kind of thing. And has this, do you think, changed at all the way you're now going to look at the world around you, or were you quite surprised by the way our brain processes like the things around us? In some respects, I come from a slightly different angle, but it more or less confirms what I've the sort of things I've often thought about anyway. It was really interesting, yes. And most helpful, actually, for trying to understand what goes on from day to day. So you were surprised about learning about the way you perceive the world around you, essentially? Well, apparently you can tie it up with all sorts of things that happen, you know, interrogation techniques. And a friend had a schizophrenic episode. I always sort of hit myself for not having seen what was happening earlier on. Now I understand. Why not? And um, just how incredibly complicated and good work was being done. So most people seem to have walked away with a good understanding of how we take in the world around us and may now also be able to identify when a malfunction in this leads to delusions in others. Now that's it for this month's podcast, but the next Café Scientifique will be held on Wednesday the 28th of April at the ADC Theatre in Cambridge and will be moving away from humans onto our relatives, the apes, as Dr Susan Chain discusses ape research in Indonesia and how to marry science with conservation. You can find out more about that event online at cafescientifique.org forward slash Cambridge. So come along in April to find out more about the research taking place with the apes. 
The Triple Helix Cambridge Café Scientifique is sponsored by the Medical Research Council. And this podcast was produced by me, Mira Senthi Lingam, from thenakedscientist.com. Thank you.